the story of humanity begins in a garden. I want you to think about that with me just for a few seconds. So when I say the story of humanity, I'm not talking about just some kind of species that's out there, okay? I'm talking about your story. I'm talking about my story. Our story begins in a garden. That's significant, Um, that where God chooses to start the story of humanity is not in a science lab. Um, It is not in a cosmic goop. Um, He does not start the story of humanity on a football field, okay, although we maybe sometimes live like it. Um, The story does not begin even in a house, but yet the story of us, of humanity begins in a garden, a garden called Eden. And um, man and woman, man and female are given a a task in this garden. The task is twofold, uh, work it and watch over it. We've talked about this before. To work it is to cause it to flourish. Some versions use the word cultivate. We are to cultivate Um, what God has entrusted to our care. We are to oversee it as stewards of God and we are to cause it to thrive. Not only are we to work it, we're to watch over it. We are to protect it. We are to guard against some sort of outside influence or some outside attack. And so the story begins in a garden with a task, work it and watch over it. We call this garden Eden. Um, Eden means pleasure. And I think that also is significant because it reminds us that when you and I tend to Uh, the garden, when we step into and we join God in his mission, when we join God in his work, we find pleasure. And we can try to look for pleasure in other areas, but we will always come up empty. We might chase pleasure over here or over there, but at the end, it's a dead end road. That true pleasure is when we understand who we are in relationship to God, our creator, and we join him in stewarding what what he has entrusted to our care. Eden is significant. It matters where this story begins. Today, we're in part two of the series, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Faith, and we're going to come alongside and spend a little time with a guy named Caleb. Um, Caleb's pretty interesting. Um, Caleb is kind of paired with Joshua. Sometimes we talk about Joshua and Caleb together um, because together they did something pretty significant. We talked about it last week. They go in, they spy out the land. There was one from each tribe, okay? So 12 guys go spy out the land. uh, Joshua and Caleb come back with eyes of faith. They come back and they see the territory and they say, hey, let's go up because surely God has given us possession of this land. They have belief, they have trust in in God. The other 10 spies we know, they come back and um, they don't have eyes of faith. They have eyes of unbelief. They have eyes of fear. And we know this about fear. Fear spreads, doesn't it? When when fear gets going, it's like a cancer. It just begins to spread and move throughout. And so fear spread throughout the camp. And the Israelites said, we don't want to go take possession of what God has already given us. We want to go back. We want to go back to Egypt. Now, um, we talked last week really focusing on Joshua. And uh, God says that anyone 20 and above is going to pass away in the wilderness. They're going to die. You're going to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and no one gets in except for kind of those who are 20 and, and younger. I'm going to raise up a new generation. But he specifically says, except for Joshua and Caleb. Now, Joshua kind of continues with the story. We we get to follow Joshua. He becomes the commander of the Israelites. He's the second guy. And we talked last week. He's not just the second guy. He is a shadow of Christ. He is a picture of Christ where Moses could not lead the people into the promised land. Joshua could. Yeshua could lead the people into the promised land. But where's Caleb? As you read the story, Caleb just kind of goes dark. 
Caleb must join the witness protection program because we don't hear anything about Caleb from that point until we are reintroduced to him in Joshua chapter 14. He logs off of Twitter and um, we don't hear a word, a tweet, okay, out of Caleb. Whereas Joshua becomes this leader, you know, for the Israelites, Caleb just kind of sinks into the background, doesn't he? Caleb doesn't have a title. He's not Commander Caleb. He's not King Caleb. He's not Caleb the priest. He's not Caleb the prophet. What that means is, it means no one salutes Caleb, right? He's got no badges on his chest. No one bows before uh, Caleb. No one brings an offering to Caleb as a sign of worship to God. No one asks Caleb, hey, what does God say about Caleb is just Caleb. Can anybody relate to just Caleb? I can. Sometimes we read the, uh, the stories about Joshua. We read stories about the commander. We read stories about kings. And we're like, man, I could never do what those guys did. But Caleb is just ordinary Caleb. If you have your Bibles, join me in Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Again, uh, 45 years pass and we don't hear a peep out of Caleb. Then all of a sudden in Joshua chapter 14, uh, Caleb just kind of reintroduces himself. Uh, 45 years has passed. We're going to discover that uh, Caleb is 85 years at the time. And and here's kind of the context before we jump in and read. Um, Joshua has been leading the people for about four or five years into the promised land. Uh, Three tribes have taken possession of their land east of the Jordan uh, River, but west of the Jordan, um, they're going to start taking possession of what rightfully belongs to them. So they conquer Jericho, they conquer Ai, uh, they go through all the different, in fact, they kind of go across the middle, then they um, start capturing all the cities to the south, they start capturing cities to the north, but here's what we need to know for today, most, turn to your neighbor and say most, most of the promised land was conquered. There was still a little bit left that, um, that, that needed to be done. All right, So not all of the promised land was subdued, but most of the promised land was subdued. And so they're at the point where uh, Joshua is going to begin to divide up the land among the people. And here's what takes place. Joshua 14, verse 6, the descendants of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal and Caleb of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, you know what the Lord promised Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the Lord's servant, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to scout the land. And I brought back an honest report. My brothers who went with me caused the people to lose Heart. Remember, fear is contagious. But I followed the Lord my God mostly. All right, a few people caught. So a few people are following along, just making sure you're, you're paying attention, okay? It says, I followed the Lord my God. Say this with me. Completely. On that day, Moses swore to me, the land where you have set foot will be an inheritance for you and your descendants forever. Because you have followed the Lord my God, say this with me, completely. Now, uh, we see as Joshua is getting ready to divide up the land, the first tribe to come forward is the tribe of Judah. The first man in the tribe of Judah is Caleb. And Caleb comes before Joshua, and he begins to reflect upon the past. Hey, Joshua, remember, remember that guy named Moses? Remember him, the servant of God, the man of God. Well, he um, appointed to me a portion of the land because I followed the Lord completely. Now, Caleb is not trying to brag on himself. Caleb is not looking for a pat on the back. And I kind of find this humorous because Joshua was there. Like if anybody knew what Caleb had gone through, it was Joshua, because those two guys were kind of two peas in a pod back. They were the two spies that came back with that good report. But Caleb is not bragging on himself. Caleb wants to make sure that the request that he's about to make is connected to a promise in the past. The request in the present is connected to a promise in the past. 
So Caleb is not saying, look, I'm not looking for any favors here. I'm not looking for any kind of special um, granting of, of authority. I'm not looking for any special privileges. But what I'm coming to you is, I'm coming to you with a request that's based on a promise that God made to Moses and Moses made to me about this particular land. Now, notice what Caleb says next. As you see, the Lord has kept me alive these 45 years as he promised. Isn't that an odd way to kind of uh, tell about the time? The Lord has kept me alive. How many of you on your next birthday are going to say, the Lord has he's kept me alive, you know, another year? It kind of sounds strange, but if you uh, think back, remember God said that anyone 20 and old, older is going to die in the wilderness, except for who? Joshua and Caleb. And so in the wilderness, guess what happened? Over a 40-year period, an entire generation of people passed away. And God raised up everyone that was 20 and younger. And I'm sure there were uh, other babies and children, and another, another generation was, was coming along as well. And so at this point, there's only two people over the age of 65, and it's Joshua and Caleb. And so when he says, the Lord has kept me alive these 45 years, what he's saying is, um, God's keeping his word. God is holding, like the only reason I'm still here is because God has, this is not coincidence. Okay, this is not a fluke. This is God keeping me alive for 45 years as he promised since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel was journeying in the wilderness. And here I am today, 85 years old. How old is Caleb? He's 85 years old. Not a trick question. You don't have to know Greek, okay? He's 85 years old. Let's pause. 85 years. Whoa. Whoa. That's a lifetime, is it not? That's a lifetime for anyone. 85 years. But think with me just for a second. All the things that Caleb had experienced and walked through over 85 years. I mean, the first 40 years of his life, he lives in Egypt. Caleb remembers, like nobody else can, can barely remember, okay? But Caleb remembers a time when he was living as a slave in Egypt. I mean, he remembers what it was like to make bricks without straw. He remembers that strong, oppressive hand of Pharaoh. Caleb also remembers probably the day when Moses showed up and he confronted Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Caleb remembers those 10 plagues that took place over the land of Egypt. Caleb remembers that very first Passover where he and his household sat in a room while a lamb was sacrificed and blood went over the doorpost and his family was protected. Caleb remembers walking through the Red Sea on dry ground. Caleb remembers walking outside the camp to grab manna or bread, or actually manna means what is it. He walks out to grab what is it, and he feasts on that particular bread. He knows what it's like to go out and and feast off the hand of God because God provided quail for them to eat. Uh, Caleb remembers when Moses struck the rock and water came forth, and they all came um, and were able to drink and satisfy the, the thirst. Caleb remembers scouting out the land. Caleb remembers every day wandering in the wilderness. Caleb remembers walking across the Jordan River on dry ground and setting up that camp, that monument of 12 stones to remember God's provision and God's protection. Caleb probably remembers walking around Jericho just a few years ago, wondering, why are we doing this? Why are we walking around this city? And then on that seventh day, they blow the trumpets and the walls came tumbling down. Not because the song says it, because God's word says it. Caleb remember, like Caleb has lived a lot, okay, in 85 years. He has experienced so, so much. And here he is at a place that we would kind of look and say, he's at the end of his race. He's in that last lap, the final stretch 
home. But notice what Caleb says next in verse 11. He says, I am still as strong today as I was the day Moses sent me out. And my strength for battle and for daily task is now as it was then. Man, does that not light your fire a little bit? He's 85 years old. And he says, man, my strength, it's unwavering. My faith, uncompromised. My vision, unimpaired. My drive, uninhibited. I am just as strong today. Now, I think as we read the text, the the implication is that his physical strength was as strong as it was when he was 40 years old, 45 years ago. And there's no doubt in my mind that it was. Hey, if God can keep people's sandals intact for the Israelites over 40 years where their clothes didn't wear out, I'm pretty sure he can keep uh, Caleb's strength intact as well. But I don't think it only has to mean the physical strength. I think it also implies a a spiritual strength. That Caleb's trust, Caleb's faith in God, when he came back and he saw those giants and he brought that report and said, let's go, that's spiritual strength. 45 years later, guess what? He's still saying, let's go. He says, my strength for battle, for war, for fighting, for the kingdom of God is just as strong as it is as it was 45 years ago. And also my strength for daily tasks like mowing the yard and repairing the roof and fixing the fence and changing the oil and all those household things. My strength for the daily tasks is just as strong today as it was back then. And all of that to set up this request in verse 12. Now, give me this hill country, this hill country the Lord promised me on that day because you heard then that the Anakim are, are there as well as large fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them as promised. Caleb says, I want the hill country. If there was, look, if there's ever a guy, all right, that we would want to come alongside and say, well done, you did good. Why don't you sit back, okay, and relax and let's let the young 65-year-olds go to battle, okay? Okay. And we laugh at that, why? The first service laughs as well. We laugh at that because in our mind, 65, it's like, man, we're like way over the hill and we're coasted in too. But in in that day, like 65, man, Caleb is 85 years old and he's like, I want to go to battle. Like, I want to fight for the Lord. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm in no position to give up or quit. And if there's ever a guy that approached Joshua and said, Hey, let someone else do it. Like we would applaud Caleb. We would celebrate him. We'd throw him a retirement party and say, good job, buddy. But he says, there's a work to be done. My strength is just as strong today. And so why not me? Notice Caleb's not looking for comfort. He's looking for combat. Caleb's not looking for the conquered cities. He's looking for cities to conquer. Caleb is not satisfied or content with someone else going and doing the legwork and the hard work so that he can go in and prop up on his recliner. Caleb says, hey, there's work to be done. I'm not going to sit by and be idle because there's work to be done. Can I tell you something about idleness? Idleness is idleness, okay? You get what I'm saying? Idleness is idleness. If you are listening to this sometime in the future on the podcast, okay, you're probably thinking, what is this guy saying? Idleness is idleness. Hey, red is red. <laughs> Look, idleness, I-D-L-E, in other words, laziness, is idleness, I-D-O-L. What's an idol? I-D-O-L. It's an image, is it not? It's, some, it's an image that we create. And you might think of the the image that that people create to worship and pray to and those kind of idols. Listen, uh, I love the guy that said, our our hearts are idol factories. We're always creating images. Sometimes the image that we create is the image of ourself, the image of success, the image of what we want others to, to see us as. These are the idols. And listen, idleness, I D L E, is. Idleness, I-D-O-L. Laziness is an image that we can create, that we, that we run to comfort as a way to find pleasure, as a way to find Eden. Can I tell you something? 
Eden's not there. You don't find Eden in idleness. We discover Eden. We discover pleasure when we join God in his work. And we say like Caleb, give me the hill. He says the Anakim are there. Those are the giants. Okay, it's not like this is an easy task. In fact, I just wonder if they're kind of saving that for last. And then here Caleb comes with this bold faith saying, look, I'll do it. I'll take the hill country. You give me that mountain to climb. Hey, the Bible has some um, pretty strong warnings about idleness. If I were to ask you to think about some serious sins, some grave sins in, in the world today, we would probably uh, throw out, you know, kind of sexual sins, or we'd throw out, you know, like deceitfulness and lying and deception and how, how bad that corruption and all this, you know, injustice and all these different things. What about the sin of idleness? Let me just uh, share with you a few verses that, that the Bible has to say about idleness. Paul writes this, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 14, and we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle. Warn those who are lazy. Warn those who are just coasting. In the very next uh, letter that he writes in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3, verse 6, he says, keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to the tradition received from us. He says, look, stay away from them. You don't, you, you don't want to go near them. In the very next verse, he says this, for you yourselves know how you should imitate us. Here's why. We were not idle among you. We were not idle among you. Now, what's, what's kind of the big deal of idleness? Look at what Paul wrote to young Timothy. He says, they're not only idle, but they're also gossips and busybodies saying things they shouldn't say. When you get idle, when you get lazy, when you do nothing, it opens up the door for other sins to enter in and take root in our lives. So the Bible gives some pretty stern warnings about idleness in our life and also staying away from other, look, brothers and sisters. These are Christians. About staying away from other Christians who are lazy. Now, the word idle um, in, in the Greek is, is a compound word, two words. The first word is walk, and the second word is deviant, it, or to, to deviate from. In other words, there is a way that God intends for us to walk, and idleness is not just standing still on that walkway. Idleness is actually deviating from what God calls us to do. So listen, we need to deal with idleness in our life. Now, I want to give a caveat, because some of you here today, you, you don't need uh, to, to hear a message about idleness. You need to hear a message about rest. Idleness is not your problem, okay? Maybe overworking is your problem. You're always on the go. And the Bible holds both of these in hand. And we need to walk as followers of Christ, keeping these in balance. In fact, there is a command to rest. I love saying that sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Yeah, there we are. Some of you just woke up from one, okay? That's good. If that's your nap today, then God bless you. Remember, one of the commands is rest. It is the Sabbath. But that command is preceded by command to work. On six days, you're to labor. You're to do your part. You're to join God in the mission of advancing his kingdom upon the earth. And after six days of labor, you get weary and you get tired. Then rest. You take a break. You be still. You be quiet. And it's in that rest that that day is blessed by God. We get replenished, we get rejuvenated, we get recharged. There's a place for rest. We've got to keep idleness, though, and rest and balance, or else we'll sway one side or the other um, into a ditch. And so my prayer for you, my prayer for me is, Lord, give us the heart of Caleb. And I pray that 45 years from today, when I'm 50 years old, <laughs> that I have the heart of Caleb, that I would say, hey, pulse check, yep, it's still beating. You know what that means? It means God's not done. There's a work that we're engaging. If we're going to have the heart of Caleb, I think it's going to require a mindset shift. 
And that mindset shift requires three things. The first uh, thing is this. We've got to understand there's unfinished work to be done. There's unfinished work to be done. When Caleb approaches Joshua, remember, what does he say? There's, there's conquered cities. There's places that are just like, just vacant and ready for someone to move in and make it their home. But Caleb looks out and he sees something. What does he see? Unfinished work. There's a job that's left undone. And so Joshua, give that to me. I can't, I can't sit idle, okay, because there's unfinished work to be done. Listen, church, there's unfinished work to be done. There's unfinished work to be done. In ministry, and I'm not talking about just like professional ministry, but, but all of us are, are ministers, we're servants of Christ. He's entrusted something to us and we're to serve him. In ministry, the work is never done. And it's exhausting, but it is worth us exhausting the entirety of our lives out on the altar of ministry. It's worth it. It's worth it. Now, in most jobs, you have a task and you complete the task. You're given a project and you complete the project. But in ministry and following Christ, it is a lifelong journey of unfinished work. Antioch, Georgetown, there's unfinished work in our city. Are there people in our community who don't know the life-saving truth and reality of Jesus Christ and what he did for them on the cross? Yes, absolutely. You know what that means? It means our work's not done. There's unfinished work. Hey, there are families in our community. There are, there are marriages in our community who are struggling, who are hurting, who've experienced some, some real pain and heartache and trauma. And they're, they're wondering, is there hope for this marriage? Listen, there's unfinished work to be done. We have a job to do. There are students in our community who are looking for life. They're looking for life outside of Jesus Christ. And we all know that's an empty well. So there's unfinished work to be done. There are kids who need to know they are made in the image of God. God has a purpose and a plan for their life. And he sent Jesus to die for them. There's unfinished work to be done. There are men and women in isolation, in depression, wondering, does anybody care? There are people who are drifting through life like a ship lost at sea. There's unfinished work to be done. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was having lunch with a really close friend, and we we're just having a, a, a great, friendly conversation, and, and he, he tossed out this question. He said, hey, Andy, do you feel like now that we're in the new building, uh, this new space, do you feel like we've arrived and it took me like a, a tenth of a second, okay, a split second to respond back, heck no. Absolutely not. There's not an ounce in my being, okay, that believes for a second that we have arrived. You know why? Because there's unfinished work to be done. We're not done until this entire city that God has placed us and planted us and trusted us to be light of the world until everyone comes to the knowledge of knowing him. And I'm inviting you to join me until God brings us home. We don't, we can't, we, there's no time to sit idle because there's unfinished work to be done. Number two, um, someone ought to do it, right? We're changing our mindset and here's the mindset. Someone ought to do it and someone is me. I love what... Um, Caleb says to Joshua um, at the end of verse 12, he says, perhaps the Lord will be with me. And I love this because he's not presuming upon God that, you know, hey, God's gonna do this and he's gonna do it through me. He's not presuming, but he's saying, you know what? I'm gonna operate by faith. I'm gonna trust God. And just perhaps, who knows, God would use me. Caleb could have looked at Joshua and said, you know what, buddy? We go a long way back. Someone needs to go take the hill country. Someone ought to do it. You got someone in mind? But Caleb is not a problem spotter. He's a problem solver. There's a lot of problem spotters who can spot the problems, right? And we spot the problems, what do we say? We say, someone ought to do that. Someone ought to, and we always think of someone as someone else. I want to let you know, this past week, I looked at our entire role as a church, every person who calls Antioch their home, every person who's ever attended. And can I tell you something? The name someone is not there. Someone 
does not attend our church. If someone shows up, we're going to kick someone out because we don't want someone. You get what I'm saying? Someone doesn't attend. So if you ever think, hey, someone will do it, they're not going to do it because someone don't go here. <laughs> we ought to have the mindset of Caleb. We're not going to sit idle. Listen, someone ought to do it. That's true. And someone is me. Someone is me. The third thing I think is uh, Caleb's mindset is he followed the Lord completely. Uh, we saw this word completely already show up twice. Look now at verse 13. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron still belongs to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, as an inheritance today. Why? Because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, completely. See, he gave, uh, Caleb gave God all of his being. And all of his being doesn't just mean like, okay, I give you my marriage and my kids and my work and this and that. All of his being meant all of his days. All of his days. Caleb, it never crossed his mind that he was done. It never crossed his mind that he just might be too old. No, he was completely devoted to the Lord. Hey, what excuse are you throwing out? Have you been throwing out the excuse, I'm too old? Maybe you've been throwing out the excuse, I'm too young. Hey, Paul addressed that too. He said, don't let anyone look down on your youth. If you're here today and you're between the age of 65 and 85, listen, don't let anyone look down on your youth. Okay? If Joshua is all in, we ought to be all in. Church, I want to introduce you to a dear friend of mine, Miss Betty. Miss Betty, can you come down here uh, to the front with me? I want to tell you a story about Miss Betty, and then in just a second, um, because of Miss Betty's impact and influence, you're going to um, give her just an amazing round of applause, and you're going to celebrate her uh, so well. This is Miss Betty, Miss Betty Parks. Miss Betty, you, I, um, let me, um, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I am not saying that you're 85. 78. 78. Okay, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Um, Miss Betty began attending Antioch back in 2018. We began in, in January of that year, and it wasn't long that, that you came alongside, and you began praying uh, through the service uh, for myself or for Pastor Stephen if he was preaching that day, and you prayed for every person who would come through those doors. And then we moved over to Brookwood, and you were faithful to come in and, and pray through, uh, through an entire service. And... Um, you, we had you in a room, and then we needed that room for a kids' class, and so you moved to a conference room, and then we needed that for live streaming, so we moved you over into a closet, and you were, in fact, you, you, call, you called it the prayer closet, and, um, and every Sunday, as we gathered as a church family, you were going to battle for us. As the, you're right, there were there are others that are there um, that were there with you, and um, we're thankful for that prayer team. Even now, there are people who are praying um, in and, and and for this service, and you inspire me. I'm so grateful uh, for you. Um, you have the heart of Caleb. Um, that God is not through with you, and you have a place to serve, and you are so active, and you are so faithful, and you are so encouraging uh, to myself and many others. Um, in fact, we're so grateful for you. We Every now and then, we hand out a special pair of Antioch socks, and um, <laughs> that only a few, I don't even have a pair of these, okay, and I'm kind of <laughs> jealous, but um, we're going to present these to you today, and we want to celebrate you, Miss Betty, and say, you knock our socks off. <laughs> Yes, it does. Thank you. We love you. She said prayer works. 
And if you have a prayer request, you let this woman know, and she's going to go to battle um, against the giants uh, on your behalf. And so thank you so much, Miss Betty. Also, um, on our app, uh, we have a, there's a place you can sign up to mow Miss Betty's yard this summer, okay? And so just go there. It's, 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 uh, it's somewhere. And uh, maybe we'll send it. It's on there, all right? Go um, sign up to, to mow her yard and just show her um, appreciation. Um, listen, what's your, what's your excuse? What's your excuse? Don't let anyone despise um, your, your youth. Let me close with some words um, from the Apostle Paul. We're asking God to give us the heart of Caleb, the heart of Betty. Let me end with the heart of Paul. This is in Acts chapter 20. He's, he's about to, to leave a church that he loves, and he knows that there's, there's some hard stuff in Paul's future. Now, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, compelled, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there. Paul says, look, I've, I've got to go here, and I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not sure what's going to happen to me, except that in every town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. Let's just pause and let's put this into perspective. The least affliction for Paul, I'm going to bet that you and I have never experienced that. Probably our, our highest level of affliction or suffering or ridicule or persecution doesn't even hit the radar of the least of what Paul has walked through. And he says this, but I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus and to testify to the gospel of God's grace. God, give us the heart of Caleb. Give us the heart of Miss Betty. Give us the heart of Paul that we would stand shoulder to shoulder, and we would agree with the words of Paul and say, my life is of no value to me. That all of me should be committed to all of him. That we would recognize that our purpose is to not coast into the finish line, but it is to finish our race with all the strength and the grace that God provides. And in joining God in his work, in examining what he has entrusted to us, our family, our homes, our time, our resources, our finances, our neighbors, our community, the next generation, all of that that he's entrusted to us, we would work it and watch over it. And it's in that working and watching over it that you and I find Eden. And we experience the pleasures of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we come today. We want to commit. Maybe for some it is a commitment, a first-time commitment. For others, it's a recommit. God, that we want to follow you completely. Whether you use us in the front like Joshua or you use us in the back like Caleb, God, we'd never be intimidated by the hill country. We'd never be intimidated by the mountain that is ahead of us. But God, we could echo the words of Caleb, an ordinary guy. We would echo the words that my strength today is just as it was then. God, give us a heart that endures, that perseveres, that is steadfast. God, may we steward well what you've entrusted to us. God, and we would discover Eden. God, thank you. The story begins in Eden. Right now, we pursue Eden. But God, in the end, when Christ returns, Eden is restored. So God, until then, we worship you and we adore you and we give you our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said.